we are back in session. Party Councilor President, our witness is back on the witness stand. You can be seated. Anything else on across to the 402 hearing? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. The how was the underlying image obtained in white truck underscore daytime underscore with fusion 3D model underscore 10 point dot BPM exhibit? That's this, that's the which file, Mr. McGee? Light truck daytime with Fusion 3D model. Is it video or still? It'd be a VPN. So. This one? Yeah. How is that image obtained? Hold on. Let me get it up so you can see it. This image here. You see the file name, Dr. Rubin? Yeah, I see the file. Can, can you? I have better memory for pixels than <laughs> often numerical things. So, so this, if you follow that diagram that I indicated, uh, that's uh, a reprojected uh, uh, truck, uh, 3D truck, into the night scene, then uh, overlaid. Uh, with the day scene, uh, which is one of the frames of the day video, just arbitrary frame we picked, uh, which is um, in correspondence with the night. So the night and day camera has not moved. So in that way we can uh, discern uh, with whatever the level of accuracy is in terms of location of the vehicle, uh, discern the relative position of the reprojected truck to the curb. Now, in that image, it appears that the truck is placed into the curb. So, first of all, I would like to see the whole thing, or it's, uh, is that the whole image? Quick, can you zoom it down? Two zoom it down? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, because I remember we tried not to cut anything. So, so, you cannot say that. So, you have to understand what actually, how the image is produced. Right? So it is produced by uh, mapping 3D model into the night image, right? And you produce an image that way. So each pixel is, becomes a combination uh, of the night model corresponding pixel value and the, uh, uh, whatever the truck model illumination uh, truck model illumination model we use, if, if you know what I mean. So there's a truck model, and the illumination can be used. I mean, what? How do you derive uh, pixel values? So that was actually derived from from Ferro. The so Ferro used its whatever the uh, lighting model, uh, there are different kinds. Uh, and so when we combine two images, think of it as a transparencies in perfect correspondence or up to the algorithm accuracy, and we literally look through, right? So there is uh, A being background, which is night uh, plus plus uh, day, and 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 uh, element which is the projection. So we combine them together. So it's it's not a geometrical uh, hidden line, hidden surface illumination. So in other words, if, for example, and I, um, ah, I left my, so if, for example, the, um, the wheel, um, the wheel, that wheel actually was positioned, we don't know where it's positioned right now exactly, right? In a real 3D model. So far, 3D model hasn't been even brought to, to existence, right? There is no 3D model being the scanned model by the pharaoh of the uh, crime scene, right? This is not in existence yet. This is all about pixels at this point and, and X, Y, Z positions on the truck. So, so when we bring that reprojection, we literally think of it as called alpha. I think there's a one called alpha and the other some other law 
when either you get x plus y or you get some alpha 1 x plus alpha uh, alpha 2 y when alpha 1 plus alpha 2 is uh, averages to 1. So, so, and if this guy is actually physically was beyond the curve, you would not see it because we, it's not a geometrical model that eliminates uh, a hidden uh, a hidden part. So, in this case, for example, imagine this to be one image, and this be another image. And when you would combine, you would actually see both, even though part of my hand is behind that ledge. Okay, because that's all we know. We don't know geometry yet. Okay, so but the eye is a human eye interprets it as uh, I'm not sure what. I mean, different people interpret it differently. One can say. Oh, it's digging into the ground, or oh, it's sitting on top of this guy. Okay, it's fair to say that if there was no intersection at all, then we know for sure that that guy is way away from the curve. Okay, but if there is intersection, it doesn't mean that this guy is physically over here. Particularly if the intersection is so small. Okay, if the intersection is so small. Okay, and also there's always small error in positioning. The algorithm always produces our accuracy. Any mathematical algorithm has a limited accuracy. Okay? So we're talking about literally a few pixels over here. Just right at the edge of the accuracy of the algorithm. Okay? So similarly here, uh, you, you have intersection, right? Some, some intersection indicated. But to a lesser degree, which indicates to me that the smaller part of that image of the truck intersects with the background. Okay, the only reason you see that kind of effect is because there is a, a, a bright edge, right? So the pixel values on that side of this curve, this line, are brighter. So when they add themselves, literally add x plus y, they end up with a brighter sort of intersection. And your eye interprets it as a one way or another, but it's actually you cannot make any geometrical judgment from it exactly where that vehicle is just from that. Uh, I hope I answer your question. You, you did. Uh, my, co my colleague has one question wants me to ask, so I'm going to do it now. Um, who decides, or how is it decided where the model, 3D model, is placed on the video image? Is it done by manually, or is it done by computer to match up points? How is it done? It's done by God. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there is a, pro a low projective, uh, uh, so once you click points, there is no flexibility at all. There's a mathematical law, it's a machine, and it takes pixel values from the model and simply shoots them into the image, okay? And there's no flexibility to that. And as far as I know, in the last uh, 500 years, there has been no correction to that model, not significant anyway except perhaps for my paper. Uh, I, I improved certain things. Uh, but anyway, the jokes be beyond. It's a very, very well-established mathematics. There is no uh, human decision at this point. It's so mathematics, hard, hardcore mathematics. So the software does it? To match the point? So, so the software image. has no decision as well. The, the software just implements a well-understood, well-agreed-upon mathematical formulas uh, that are called projective geometry. Uh, if you use somebody else's uh, uh, software from a reputable uh, organization, National Geospatial Agency, uh, National Security Agency, or some other photogrammetry company, you will get the, uh, pretty much the same results. You have no, if you click the same points, you will get the same results. You have no choice. Next question is, what exactly did you do from the time you received the material until you completed the exhibits? And they asked for a step-by-step -step process, if you could. Uh, if you could indulge me, could you repeat the question again? Sure. I'm a little tired. It's okay. What did you do from the time you received the material until you completed the exhibit as like a step-by-step -step process? Correct. So, as I mentioned before, it's been like three stages to this to this uh, work. Uh, the first stage, uh, when we were brought original data, 
uh, the second stage when we were visited second time, and the third stage when we were uh, uh, contacted and told that uh, uh, the, there is a trial and uh, this thing will, could go for a trial. So uh, let me clarify my question then based on that answer. Between stage one, where you got the information brought to your office, and stage two, where you met to ask, what can you tell us? What did you do between stage one and stage two? Right. So, so between stage one and two, we focused primarily on uh, classical photogrammetry methods. And uh, we were asking questions uh, by, uh, because we had a daytime, right? We knew the daytime. So we were asking questions, could we measure the dimensions, uh, positions of points in 3D space uh, like we classically measure it with uh, suspects in a bank robbery or et cetera. So, and, uh, so we focused on that and we concluded that the classical photogrammetry is not a fully appropriate method, though it's, it's, it's a correct method to a large degree, but there was a missing element, which was points in space with no relevance to 3D models from which the points come would not yield any measurements. Okay. What technology did you use in those processes of applying a non-classic method of photogrammetry? Actually, classic. Those are classic. We so. used classic methods at first. Classical mm -hmm. methods. By classical, I mean the standard photogrammetry. Uh, here are the points. Uh, here are the uh, uh, daytime scene. Uh, perhaps with few measurements, though we weren't given those measurements yet. And uh, uh, how would we go about it? And so, and we concluded that we can't really do much with that. Let me ask you, it seems to be an important question. Bro. Do you know the focal length of the security camera from the original night video that was supplied? So, it was never given to me. But I, I believe I know it. And how do you know it? It's, it's science of photogrammetry. You can determine it from, from the, uh, the scene uh, specifically from the uh, ferro laser uh, gives you uh, XYZ points and if you relate XYZ points in one of the cycles that I described when you relate the ferro image uh, to the daytime image you establish correspondence in fact between the original camera and the XYZ terrain and that gives you an equation to compute uh, focal lengths and the angle, uh, more importantly, angle of the camera. Okay. okay, what was that focal length you determined it to be? So, so as you know, focal lengths can be measured in, um, uh, focal lengths can be measured in different units. So in pixel units, I would have to draw a formula for you, uh, pixel units, I believe it's 914, nine uh, nine, around 900 pixel units. Okay. So, and if you want to know, I can tell you what the angle of the camera is. Sure, what's the angle of the camera? So, so again, it's uh, somewhat approximate, but it's roughly 40, I think it's uh, 42 degree, 42.125. Uh, horizontally. And are you memorizing this? No, no, I, I, I wrote that thing. I, I have a page if you want to copy on that. I don't know. Um, so um, uh, I, wrote, I wrote that down before um, during lunch. I, I kind of, I had not much to do and so I just <laughs> wrote these things. And let me ask you this, where did you get that information from to write it down? So so we did these calculations uh, in, in the process of, uh, they're not, they're internal calculations, 
but it's uh, good to know. So we discuss these things. Uh, uh, you know, the the it's an internal parameter that is not really uh, software gives you, but it's it's been looked at. Yes, to make sure it's physical. That's the other thing. So when when we do these calculations, we try to check consistency with physics. So let's say all of a sudden I get some unusual focal lengths that correspond to telephoto camera or something like this, then I know something is wrong. So whatever data that we can calculate to disprove the hypothesis, we look at it. Next question is, is what's the focal length of the camera that took the base picture in the picture that's still up? Direction vague as the base picture. With the technical term. Uh, overall, the answer here is yes. Uh, there's only one camera on the crime scene. Right. I assume the base picture would be for the truck model, because he says, what's the focal length of the camera that took the base picture? Oh, you mean the, the ferro? Apparently, yes. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, uh, it's not important, actually. Uh, it, it's not important at all because I assume that uh, I assume that Faro people uh, that their system is consistent. It's been uh, ground tested by thousands of photogrammetrists. So, well, isn't it true the focal length of the nighttime video image does not match the focal length for the 3D image of the Faro image? then the perspective and the dimensions of the object in the picture can be skewed when trying to compare. No, no, you can, um, you can match uh, two images taken by completely different cameras. Yes, but the focal length. It doesn't matter, you can have, I can take your picture with a photo, telephoto zoom, and then took my iPhone and take another picture, and then uh, do the, uh, uh, and if, uh, as, as, uh, if, if, if I know the X, Y, Z, the depth which Farrah gives me, I can establish correspondence, projective mapping from a picture taking with telephoto, zoom, $8,000 camera, and my iPhone. Uh, there's no, there's no, uh, photogrammetry doesn't tell you that it has to be taken with cameras with the same focal lengths. But you have to know the focal length of the two, correct? Uh, focal length is derived from so if you want to be technical, I could write you an equation, but basically projective mapping is a matrix that is a, a product of three matrices, R, T, and K. And R is rotation, which is three angles. It finds, tries to find the three earlier angles, relative angles, I think they, you can think of it as your, um, what, what is this, this one, this one, and that one. Uh, uh, in, a, in a three different angles, right? So uh, I forgot what, what you call them in uh, aircraft. I'm a little tired. So your three angles, okay? Yeah. So that's three parameters. Uh, then there is also shift. You need to know what is the XYZ position of the camera with respect to your coordinate system, okay? So that's uh, three numbers. That's a together now it's six numbers. And plus, there's another matrix, which is called K, calibration matrix, which is uh, basically, uh, if you think about it, it has physics, uh, which gives you focal lengths in it. It has uh, um, uh, two, uh, two uh, actually two focal lengths, the horizontal and vertical, people don't know that, but there's actually two numbers. And then there is a skew number that is third, which makes a rectangle kind of parallelogram. And then there is um, uh, two more numbers, which are position of the optical center that, uh, through which the pinhole system works, which uh, doesn't have to be in the center, as it turns out. So depending on how precise the lens is, but none of them exactly. So that's your five parameters. So do you need to know all of them? They, they, they got internally calculated. I don't need to know anything. That's the beauty of photogrammetry. I, I really don't need to know anything about the camera to calculate the uh, projective uh, matrix. But 
once I calculate the projective matrix, I can factor out both R, T, and K, and I can actually find out all of the above. I can tell you where the camera is, I can tell you what the focal length is, I can tell you what the angle of the camera with respect to the coordinate system is, I can tell you what the screen transformation, as a matter of fact, there are even other optical uh, distortions that, that can be calculated from that, barrel distortion, pin cushion, and, and so on. So I teach that stuff. So, um, yeah, so you, you can derive all of that. Now, if you do know that, uh, if you do know, you do know somehow those calibration parameters, internal calibration, focal lengths, then you need less than six points. Then you can actually use four points, and in some cases, three points. Okay, and we did experiment with four points. Uh, and so it's not presented here, but it was also an interesting experiment. So, and again, that didn't need community is that it can be accurate. Do you agree with what the community's opinion is of the feral skin? And it's actually relevant. The foundation, if it's admissible. Well, we're open to answer if he understands the question. So basically, you're asking me a question whether I think a feral is a good scanner. Correct. So everything I heard about it is, there are basically only two companies that I know that people compare, which is that and Leica. Uh, that is becoming a hexagon, and uh, the opinion is, uh, I think, Ferro comes from UK, and opinion is it's way cheaper, and some people think it's way better, or at least as good. Let's see, now, in the image that was up before, the daytime image overlaid with the nighttime image with the 3D model that we had up, is it your testimony that the 3D model exactly depicts the actual size, shape, location, and perspective of the vehicle that is partially shown on the security vision? It's a compound, compound question. I mean, you have to, you have to factor it out like those matrices. Excuse me. So you you compounded uh, shape, size, and location. So and perspective. And perspective. So basically, uh, it all boils down to. In this case, there's nothing about size. It's it's all about projective mapping. Projective mapping is just a formula. It's a very sophisticated formula. Okay, a set of equations that takes. Uh, points on the surface of the truck in a coordinate system of the truck and projects it into the image in the coordinate system of the image. And that's all it does. It doesn't, it doesn't like ask questions, what's the size of this object? What's, it doesn't even deal with an object in itself. It deals with separate pixels of the object. It looks at the object as a set of pixels. So if that's true, would the computer change the perspective of the 3D model to make it match the points? Since size doesn't matter. It would change perspective model in a way I, I, I described. It's not a perspective model. It just finds a like, true physical location of that. Uh, so think, think of our coordinate system of the camera, as I pointed out, and the, uh, and the truck. So it actually moves the truck and moves the truck and moves the truck until it gets the best match for those points. And then it projects it. But it doesn't do anything to the truck. Truck is solid. You cannot pull it, stretch it, and so on. But the 3D ferro model, when it turns, the perspective changes and the size relation changes from the front, or the closest part of the model, to the viewpoint, to the rear. The front it, point will get larger and the rear will get shorter, correct? Yeah, but in, whatever the projective, uh, whatever the projective will says, it will do accurately. Well, it, just as if this would change. When your computer software places the 3D object to match the points, does it record the per perspective ratio that's necessary to move that I that object to get that projective mapping? Okay, there is no such a mathematical entity as for projective ratio. There is a matrix, as I said, okay? Matrix is a table of elements. 
and that matrix is uh, uh, 11 by 11, okay? But it's a diagonal matrix, and it doesn't have everything. So there's some symmetry if you want to go in detail. So it's a really uh, a matrix, and that's what it computes. And according to that matrix, transformation takes place, and it corresponds to true physical movement of the three-dimensional object in the coordinates of the original uh, camera, and that's all. And then it just glues it back to that. What would the camera see if the... So, uh, let me just say this. Uh, there's another way of thinking about it. If you think the way, let's say, FBI does uh, measurements, they don't do this whole equations and all this. What they do, what they would do in this case, for example, now that I know that they've done it with vehicles, they would take a true vehicle and they would bring the vehicle into the scene, okay? And they would move in the vehicle until the vehicle appears the closest possible to the image on that same camera that has not moved. And at that point, they say, okay, that is the closest we can get. Are there any matches or mismatches? And then they will just reject it if there are significant mismatches. And if, if they match it, they say, okay, we couldn't reject it. Okay, that's, that's all. But they also, of course, have dimensions now because it's a true, it's a true thing and they know where it is. So, okay, we obviously could not do anything like this. We did not have that vehicle. Okay, and even if we had it, it's very difficult. We actually done that kind of experiment and we stopped traffic on, we were doing this kind of experiment on one of the offshoot streets and the local police department allows us to do it, which was a lot of fun. And so, but it was on the radio that, that we stopped the traffic in Los Angeles. So it's very difficult, very costly, and that's why we thought about this method as being much more publicly acceptable, which is just computer scientists sitting on the computer. But we're not changing any perspective in any physical manner. And there are no ratios. It's, it's, it's uh, I mean, I know artists like to think about ratios as some kind of simplified perspective. No, it's, 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 a, it's a matrix, and there are equations. There's so many equations. So the, the matrix equation of when it was placed, did it project, or did it tell you where it was on the matrix diagonal equation table? Telling you what measurements or what perspective that thing had to be changed to match those 10 points. So yeah, it, it has some numbers. The projective matrix has numbers. And you simply multiply, uh, as in my uh, slides, you basically take x, y, z times this matrix. And if you know how to multiply the column of vectors by a matrix, it produces corresponding u and v which are actually horizontal vertical position for each XYZ three-dimensional kind of voxel or pixel into the pixel of the camera. And what was that value that had to be used in this case? I would just have to look at uh, computer. I don't, I, I don't necessarily look at the value. I usually look at, it's a combination of rotation, translation, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, calibration. So it's a very, very thin matrices of which uh, you can say what each of them is if you really are interested. So if you want us to produce the calibration, uh, I'm sorry, uh, projection matrix with numbers, we can give it to you, but it won't tell you much. N not the best expert in the world could look at it and say, oh, that means that. It's like combining gravity law and, and Maxwell equations, and uh, I don't know what, what other other things, uh, nature, laws, and say, what does it, and thermodynamics, what does it mean? Okay, uh, it means that nature is very complicated, so that's what it means. Now, you were talking about guarded error in whether or not you can reject an item based on an error, and you said you were suspicious of error that reached 10% error. Correct. What was the error rating on this analysis? So when you say this analysis, you mean uh, matching two patterns, one pattern being set of points on the truck and the set of points on the uh, uh, on the image? Yes. Because there are some other things that we've done. So this one was uh, way within the uh, acceptable error bounds that we've seen in anything.
you know, screwed down. So my question was, what was the percentage? Uh, this one is very hard to measure in percentages because it's not the size. If we were measuring the size, if we were measuring the size, we would know what the true size is and what the size we derive, and we would know the percentage. If, in this case, it's called a projection error. So it's it measured in pixels, and typically in photogrammetric measurements, uh, people don't like uh, outliers. So if there's some point that is uh, everybody else is about one or two off uh, uh, in projection error, and the other one is like five points or even like 10 points, you know you have a problem. So we don't have outliers in this case. We did not, did not find outliers. So that's a standard practice in photogrammetry. It's called reprojection error. It's not measured in percentage because there is not, it's not percentage of anything. You said the error was on the border of rejection, on the, direct. Uh, what about? The, that's a different error. Okay. You're missing a little bit. Okay, so what was that error and how, what was that error value and why was it on the border of rejection? So, so I'm not sure I said on the border of rejection, uh, let me rephrase. So there was another thing that we've done. So we continued computing everything we could compute at this point that we know how to compute. So if you remember this diagram that I drew, uh, after uh, point matching and determining the projection error, then we injected or started using uh, information from the scan, uh, from the um, uh, scan of the uh, crime scene, right? I think that there was a name of it, some name, right? So attached to it. Uh, and so the name of the file says, says MS something. And um, so when we use that, we were able to position the, what we consider to be ground points for the measuring the base of the will. And, uh, and those pictures were not presented here uh, because they were much more recent, but they are, they are available. And um, we measured, uh, so we measured the wheelbase of the vehicle according to fair model, it's supposed to be that we had, okay, that we had. Uh, we looked at the uh, axis uh, front to back and we measured, uh, just to make sure I, I'm right, uh, we measured 10.71 or something, I may be off by, Point one or point two, so it's it's in data I have actually in my computer I have those files. So ten point seven one, uh, if you look at inches, you have to just convert. I mean, I, I don't like to think inches on feet. I just think in terms of feet. Ten point seven one. Um, Let me ask you: Is ten point seven one in meters? No feet. So the wheelbase was ten point seven one feet. Yeah, according to Ferro model. And we don't really care. Even if the model is not accurate, which is not usual, uh, all we care is that when we reproject and we measure, it should be the same and what or was, similar. What was the measurement when you, when you measured on projection? So I think that one measurement, we did several measurements. Uh, the closest measurement that we got was about uh, 10.5 something. So. 5.5 or something, or 10.56, and uh, the further measurements were uh, around, I think, as low as 10.15. So it was a half a foot off. So, no, no, it's not, uh, okay, 10.15 and then, uh, yeah, okay, so, um, we basically, it's, uh, up to 6%, so now you can, yeah, yeah you can cover that, I'm a little tired here. So it's 6% in a worst case scenario, and uh, roughly 3% uh, in the average scenario. No matter how we use that thing, that's roughly what we were getting, plus minus. So, so but what concerned me was the larger error which is like if it went to beyond, let's say, let's say seven, eight percent, and it was consistent, then I would just say, uh, okay, that's a test fail. But at this point, uh, I would say, again, no test fail. But but I cannot call this. Oh, okay, we got that measurement, and it's that that close. 
because that would be identification at this point. It's not just a rejection. That would be the more measurement points you get, right? The more you go towards actual identification. Uh, but even if we got an exact one, it's still not identification. Just because I measured uh, a, a wheel base at 10.71, I haven't really identified it yet. Did you offer to write a report for all this, all these findings and all the tests you've done? No. Did you offer to write a report on your findings? Objection has to be answered. Did you inform Mr. Dowdery on your stage two meeting that the wheelbase measurement didn't match? Objection assumes facts on evidence and misstates his testimony. Sustained this phrase. And the uh, PowerPoint that we saw today, when did you produce that? Well, I basically had it. I just had to delete some files from it. But when did you give it to I them? mean, delete some slides. When did you hand the PowerPoint over, though? To oh, oh, it's just today. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, just today. I don't have any more questions for a four or two year old. Okay. Um, you, re you referenced other studies or other experiments that you did. Yes. Are all of those, those are all in the computer? Oh, other studies uh, in relevant? On, on this case, with regard to this this particular case. I, I didn't save all the results. I may have some. Uh, I just picked what I thought was the most uh, relevant. Uh, okay. And, and those that you thought were most relevant, those are still in your computer? Not only my computer. I, I gave them to the, uh, to the council. Okay. Okay. That's fine then. Okay. Uh, so we're done with the 402 hearing? Yes. Okay. We're with this witness, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you're done for today. I'm not sure when they're going to have you come back and actually testify. Tomorrow at 10.30, please. <laughs> Tomorrow at 10.30? Do I have a choice? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. If that really didn't work, we could we could work something else. I choose to be tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. That's fine. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow at ten thirty, and then I'll see you council at nine. Yeah, we because we have some issues that we want to discuss with courts about discovery and lack of discovery about what we're provided. I've never seen and heard about this wheel based experiment that's off. All right. Those no. are the things that we can probably discuss at nine. Nine o'clock tomorrow. Yes. Because there's a lot of discovery we're missing. And that's, as Mr. Molina is whispering in my ears, we have a lot of issues that we're going to be objecting to to him testifying until we get all this information. Well, all the things you talked about today, you gave to the district attorney either on a disk or in the PowerPoint presentation, or, or, or is there more? data or material that you have in a, either in your computer or somewhere else. So 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 in defense of counsel, uh, I, I gave it to them, but uh, final transmission was last night, and there is a reason for that. So uh, so they received it very recently. Okay, so everything you have, you've now given to them. Yes, and, and I, if I could interject, I never said that the measurements were off. I just indicated the measurement error. There was a, yeah, I understand the difference. Thank you. D just to be clear, um, what he provided to me, I did provide to counsel previously. The calculations that he's referring to that were subsequently done, I have not received a transmission giving me a link to, he, I, he usually drops them in like a Dropbox. Up until this morning, I have not received that link to go in and get that. Um, so I will verify with him who he sent it to so I can get that and transmit it to defense counsel. 
but as of today's hearing, I haven't. He said he sent it last night, but I physically don't have it. Okay, so let's hopefully we can resolve that by tomorrow morning. And, and I can explain why such lateness occurred. Okay. And the reason for that is that we had for a while a model, and it said, uh, if I believe, Max Day House, and the name of it was Max Day House. And I assume that that is a house which is different from the house that we were looking at. Uh, I believe at, at some point I said, what is that house? So, uh, and it turns out that this model, their model of the crime scene, extended from some other house down to the street, and they scanned the whole area, which included the house which is depicted in the evidence camera, uh, in the, the, the area in front of the house. And I had no idea about it until, I would say, a week, a week ago, when we finally uh, uh, said, oh, okay, so maybe it's there about a week ago. And we said, oh, okay, if we have that, we can do a few more things, like measurement of the base wheel, wheel base. And, but it, it took time to process it. It's not instantaneous. And to be very careful, we went over it over and over and over and over and over again, and until we were satisfied that the results are consistent. Okay. And then it just, I transmitted it. Final results were transmitted yesterday, though I did mention them on the form that I'm working on it to counsel prior okay. to that. So you can coordinate, make sure that uh, counsel got the final transmission of all from that material. Okay? Okay. So I'll see counsel at 9 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. And as of now, we'll plan on seeing you at 1030. We'll see how that goes. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. I can't step this down. Yes. Thank you.